Hi everyone, last week I talked about hyperpigmentation and today I'm doing a dedicated view to hydroquinone because it has been so controversial because it's just been taken off the US uh, over-the-counter shelves and because it's been around for 70 years. So if you're new here, uh, consider subscribing. Also check out my website and consider subscribing to my newsletter. And now let's Oh, and like this video if you don't mind, and let's get into it. Hydroquinone was accidentally discovered in 1938 in Chicago in a leather tannery. The workers uh, there that wore gloves um, noticed uh, areas of depigmentation on their hands where the gloves make contact with their skin, and it turned out the gloves had a hydroquinone byproduct or a derivative in, in the gloves that caused the skin lightening. And in the 50s, it made it onto the cosmetic market. And in the 60s, uh, research on hydroquinone really began. So it's been around for 70 years. We have 70 years of research and just uh, anecdotal experience. Uh, and I will go into the research at the end for those that find it really boring, <laughs> we'll leave it for the end. Um, but a little bit about hydroquinone. It is not a bleach, contrary to popular belief. It is a molecule or a compound that works by inhibiting the production of the melanosomes and the melanin pigment. So it inhibits the enzymes tyrosinase, which uh, is important in the production of the pigment, and it also affects um, RNA uh, synthesis in the production of the melanosomes, which are the uh, containers for the pigment, if you will. It has been well established that hydroquinone, while lightening the skin, uh, does not cause permanent results. In other words, generally, when you stop using the product, the pigmentation can come back. The common side effects for hydroquinone include redness, dryness, inflammation, and irritation. And the most well-known and scary side effect that everyone worries about is pseudoocrinosis or also known as exogenous ochronosis, and that is the development of a dark pigmentation that's more kind of grayish in color that tends to be permanent after prolonged use of hydroquinone. However, even though everyone worries about this and everyone's very conscious of it, there have only been 22 cases reported in the United States ever of this condition and it's usually at higher doses of 8% and in patients who don't follow the protocol of using it up to five or six months and then stopping for a time before resuming their regimen. Now, worldwide, um, there have, has been a different spectrum of toxicity associated with hydroquinone. However, um, a lot of the hydroquinone products were contaminated with mercury. They were not used under physician supervision. The concentrations were um, up to 8%, which is very high. And it was just an unregulated use of the product. So using that as a standard for um, a regulated physician supervised use can be misleading. In 1996, the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health uh, published a paper where they described the presence of arbutin and hydroquinone in plasma and urine of humans that had no, no, no known exposure to hydroquinone or arbutin. And so it came to be discovered that arbutin and or hydroquinone can be found in products like wine, coffee, tea, broccoli, pears, and wheat products. And I tried to see if those are contaminants in the food, but I couldn't find any evidence that they are so it's hard to know if they're naturally occurring in foods or if they're contaminants in our food. And I, I, I'm not sure I couldn't find the answer to that. There have been quite a few studies over the last seven years done on hydroquinone to establish safety. The majority of the studies that were done have been done on rats or mice and the toxic results in rodents are difficult to extrapolate and apply to people. Um, and the studies that have been done on people have always not, not necessarily been structured in the best way. And just to give you an example, um, 
it has been shown that hydroquinone has a very high absorption rate into the skin of 10 to 11 percent however um the vehicle that hydroquinone was put in before application to the skin was ethanol. And ethanol really drives active ingredients into the skin at a much higher concentration than say a cream or a gel or an emulsion. So using ethanol is going to increase the absorption of the active ingredient. And ethanol is prohibited in the United States as a vehicle for hydroquinone delivery. So this research result is, is not applicable because no one puts hydroquinone in ethanol. These are the kinds of things that have been pro problematic with the research. I found a really nice paper um, on hydroquinone, an evaluation of the human risks for its carcinogenic and mutagenic properties. And this is a paper from 2008. And it discusses a whole gamut of research that's been done on hydroquinone. And ultimately, the conclusion is the research is inconclusive. The problems are in the research. So here, there are uh, a few cohort uh, studies of workers exposed to hydroquinone. So one study showed that workers with definite and lengthy exposure to hydroquinone, either during its manufacture or its use, had lower cancer rates compared to two comparison populations. And the reason for this could not be explained. In another study for hydroquinone, it was observed that a group had increased development of melanoma. However, upon closer assessment, it turned out that some of the people who had developed melanoma actually had no exposure to hydroquinone. So it's confusing how this research was even designed. Another uh, research cohort looked at uh, people who worked with um, in motion picture film processing and they had a higher incidence of respiratory system uh, malignancy. However, they were developing the film and they were exposed to a slew of chemicals in addition to hydroquinone. So again, it's impossible to know what was the culprit that actually caused the malignancies. And they didn't even look to see uh, which of these people were smokers and which were not smokers. So as, as I think you must be getting um, the picture that these studies are not well designed. Now, two other um, studies I found on humans, one was done in Africa, which was totally unreliable because the hydroquinone was contaminated with mercury. Mercury we know is extremely toxic, so it's difficult to know what toxicity was from the mercury and what toxicity was from the hydroquinone. And there was another study where people took oral, they had oral consumption between 300 and 500 milligrams per day, and they showed no cancer development and no liver toxicity. Now going into animal research, the animal research usually involved either oral ingestion or injection of incredibly high doses of hydroquinone and then observation. Um, and they did find that rats that had um, chronic renal disease and almost renal failure had a tendency to develop uh, renal tumors. But then they found that the renal tumors were more associated with the chronic renal failure than the actual hydroquinone. And then they suspected the hydroquinone caused the chronic renal failure in these rats. One study showed that leukemias were seen in rats when exposed to extremely high doses of hydroquinone. However, subsequent research did not corroborate these findings. And there has never been a link found between hydroquinone and cancer of any kind in human beings. Um, it's been shown that hydroquinone is mutagenic in vitro and in vivo, meaning it can change the DNA or mutate genes. Um, again, not in humans, but it has been shown to uh, be toxic to the genes and cause chromosomal abnormalities in rodent bone marrow cells. When they tried this in living animals, again, they injected extremely high doses into the peritoneal cavity. So that's the space where all the bowel lives. So the drug would be absorbed through um, all the tissues, all the walls of the bowel. 
this was actually considered an inappropriate research uh, study. And five studies were done by the oral route, and the ones done by the oral route uh, showed no significant effect on the rodents. So their conclusion was the evidence in the database for any genotoxic toxic effect in vivo is sparse and none has been observed in the kidney. So if we take all this data and try to use some common sense and extrapolate to the best of our ability, we know that we never use hydroquinone with ethanol and we never mix it with mercury, so that information is not helpful. We also don't mix it with a whole bunch of other toxic chemicals that are used for film developing, so that's not helpful. We do know that this product has been used for 70 years and there have been no reported uh, malignancies and no tendencies towards malignancy in people who've used it. We do have a study of people taking it orally and no negative side effects happened there. And we know that in toxic concentrations, um, there has been an induction of renal failure, which led to renal tumors in rats. There's one study that showed they may have an increase in leukemia and five subsequent studies that said they couldn't reproduce those results. The findings that hydroquinone affects the genes in a negative way and causes mutations, um, that study was deemed inappropriate because such toxic levels of hydroquinone were injected into the peritoneal cavity, so the, the cavity of the abdomen and that was also not reproducible when they gave them oral toxic doses uh, orally by mouth. So ultimately, there are a few papers in rodents that say it's toxic. There are a few papers where it's mixed with mercury that say it's toxic, but there's really no substantial and serious research looking at hydroquinone with a study design that would in any way mimic or reflect um, prescription strength and prescription use of the medication. My personal view on hydroquinone is that as long as it is under a doctor's supervision and isn't used for more than five months and doesn't go above 4%, uh, there's absolutely nothing to suggest it's toxic. and. It's been around 70 years to prove that. So I use it myself, I think it's fine. I would never use it continuously all year long. I use it usually only in the fall after getting a lot of sun in the summer. So why has over-the-counter hydroquinone disappeared in the United States? Well, it's because of the new CARES Act that uh, came into effect due to the current world situation. And under the CARES Act, hydroquinone is classified as a brand new drug. So um, because it's classified as a brand new drug, it's required to submit a new drug application within 180 days of the FDA enforcement. And unfortunately, the cost for the application approval, processing fees, and clinical studies is estimated at $19 million and can take up to a year. So if this CARES Act stays in effect, the chances of hydroquinone coming back to over-the-counter are slim, but it still is available by prescription. In conclusion, there is so much junk data, essentially junk data out there that you can draw any conclusion that you want. There has been no research to definitively show harm to humans. And there has been research of contaminated products showing harm, that's not good research. Although, as I said, there hasn't been a good study designed to show a long-term effect of a prescription strength treatment. So looking at studies that talk about toxic doses of things, it, it's irrelevant to reality. You can make anything look bad. You can make water look bad. You can make hydroquinone look bad by saying it's a derivative of benzene and benzene is a carcinogen. 
Well, water is a derivative of hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide is so combustible, it's used to send rockets into space, but that derivative of hydrogen peroxide, water and oxygen are not bad for you. So it, it's, um, it's just basic chemistry. All right, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys in the next one.